So, welcome to Wildwood and welcome to our virtual tour of the Reptile House. Because of the Covid restrictions, we're not able to open the building, so we've put together a little selection of what you can see inside. All the animals in the reptile house are cold-blooded and the terms cold blood and warm blood are actually a bit misleading. It's to do with how animals get their warmth. The truth is the only totally cold-blooded animals are ones that are dead. A cold blood actually gets its warmth from around it. A warm blood generates its own warmth in its body. The truth is most animals are cold-blooded. The only truly warm-blooded animals are mammals and birds. Generating your own warmth takes a lot of energy and you don't want to lose that energy so the warm-blooded animals have a covering on their bodies to keep the heat in. Mammals they have fur or hair, birds they have feathers and the reason for doing this means you can be active regardless of what the conditions are like around you. A good example, um, imagine sitting in a park in the summertime. You'll see lots of butterflies and lots of birds. If you are in the same park in the winter, no butterflies, but still birds. Our reptile house focuses mainly on amphibians and reptiles. They have certain similarities. Both groups have skeletons inside the bodies. Mostly, they're found living on land. Most of them breathe air using lungs as adults. I'm saying that very, very carefully. And they hatch out of eggs. There are a few that deliberately hold the eggs in their body until the babies hatch out, but it's still a type of egg. Saying that though, there are big, big differences between an amphibian and a reptile. Amphibians have soft skins. They're known as being water permeable, which means they let water through. It's the reason why you should never touch a frog or a toad with dry hands. If you ever have to move a frog or toad, make sure your hands are nice and wet and that they stay wet. Also, amphibians lay jelly-coated soft eggs, frog spawn, toad spawn, that have to be kept nice and damp. Reptiles are very different. They have dry, scaly skins that are fully waterproof. And they lay eggs that actually have shells, so they don't have to be kept damp. Because they're cold-blooded, the reptiles and the amphibians do very well in places like jungles and swamps where it's both damp and warm. Where reptiles do better than amphibians are the places that are hot and dry, so particularly deserts. Where amphibians score over reptiles, well, amphibians can be active at lower temperatures, colder climates. I've actually seen footage of toads spawning in the snow up a mountain, and that's something you'll never see the reptiles doing. They need it quite a bit warmer. There aren't many reptiles and amphibians that live wild in Britain. We have about 13. The way I remember them is three by three and two by two. There are three native snakes, three native lizards, three native newts. There are also two native toads and two native frogs. The toads that we have here in the reptile house are known as common toads and they're the most numerous and widespread of the two types of toad in Britain. The other one is known as the natterjack toad and is sadly quite rare today. If you're wondering about the frogs, the British frogs are the pool frog, which is found in one or two locations, and the common frog, which is the one that you usually find in people's gardens. 
Toads and frogs do belong to the same family. They're known as Anuran amphibians. And if you're wondering about the difference, really, if it has a dry, warty skin, it gets called a toad. If it has a smooth, wet skin, it gets called a frog. In some of the families, you'll find frogs and toads being grouped together. It gets complicated. Common toads, well, how to recognize them? They don't tend to jump, they tend to walk. They are surprisingly long-lived and they undertake yearly migrations to the ponds where they originally hatched. That's where they'll spawn again. They are very much a friend to gardeners because they eat a lot of creepy crawlies that are pests, particularly slugs and snails. Believe it or not, in the Middle Ages, toads were very popular as pets for witches. It was believed they had the ability to cure some witches would actually dress up their pet toads in little green velvet capes and ribbons of silk and silver bells, which suggests some witches had too much time on their hands. Toads have long been associated with magic, medicine and poisons. They can produce something called bufotoxins from the glands on the backs of their heads. This is basically a type of disgusting tasting chemical, which means that animals won't eat them. Some toads produce much stronger bufotoxins. The cane toads produce toxins strong enough to kill a large dog. And in North America, there are types of toads that are sometimes licked in shamanic ceremonies to produce a hallucinogenic effect. We have two corn snakes in the reptile house. This is Weasley easily recognized as it's the orange one. And our second corn snake is called Optimus. Corn snakes are the most popular of all the pet snakes. Very easy to keep, very easy to look after. But I should say, like any pet, if you were thinking of getting a snake, you have to do all your research ahead of time and make sure it's the right animal for you. Why do we have corn snakes at the reptile house? They're not native to Britain. They actually originally come from North America. But sadly, they sometimes get abandoned. They can't survive in Britain, certainly not with the winters, and they have to be rehomed somewhere. As I say, corn snakes are one of the most popular pet snakes, and they come in a whole range of different colors. There are more than 22 recorded color varieties. Weasley here is one of the more exotic colors. Optimus is closer to the wild color, a mix of brown colors, greys. No one's entirely sure where they get their name corn snake from, but they do live wild in the wheat fields of North America. They're also found around barns where you store corn, and that's because they get rid of mice and rats. They're actually popular with a lot of farmers. Now, snakes get a very bad reputation. They're usually being shown as being nasty or dangerous or evil, and that's not fair. The truth is, we see them as being a bit odd. They don't have arms, they don't have legs, they don't have fur. So a lot of people don't see them as being nice or cuddly. It's fair to say that there are different attitudes in different parts of the world. In the West, so Europe, Greece and North America, snakes are quite often seen as being evil or dangerous. If you think of the snake in the Garden of Eden, or St. Patrick driving the snakes out of Ireland. But over in the East, there's a very different attitude to snakes. They're seen as being powerful, but not so much dangerous. Uh, these include things like the Naga, who protect ancient wisdom in India, or the Uraeus in ancient Egypt that protect the Pharaoh. One of the biggest differences, and he's realized I'm talking, one of the biggest differences is shown in the story Jungle Book. In the Disney versions of Jungle Book, the snake, Ka, is a bad guy. But in the original story, written by Rudyard Kipling, Ka was one of the good guys. He was a bit odd, a bit strange, but he actually helped to save Mowgli from the monkeys.
And this is because in Roger Kipling's time, you'd actually keep pythons in the house to get rid of mice and rats. So he knew that the snakes might be a bit strange, but they weren't nasty or dangerous. In here, we have some tarantulas and a couple of hissing cockroaches. I should say straight away, again, you don't find tarantulas living wild in Britain. They are pretty much the largest of the spider family and they're very popular in horror films because they look very, very scary and intimidating. The truth is, tarantulas aren't very dangerous. Uh, they are fairly slow moving, they're pretty docile, and their bite is about as bad as a bee sting. Right at the top, we have a pair of hissing cockroaches. Hissing cockroaches come from Madagascar, off the coast of Africa. The reason why they make a hissing noise is to try and scare away predators. So again, perfectly harmless. Time for another snake. This time, it's the turn of a Californian king snake, whose name is Zebi. Currently, Zebi is at the back of the enclosure underneath the heat mat where it's nice and warm. As the name suggests, these snakes come from California in North America. And it's probably worth mentioning that all the snakes that we have are meat eaters. In fact, all the snakes known in the world eat meat. Our guys are mainly fed on defrosted mice, and that's about the size of the prey they take in the wild. But some snakes do have other diets. There are some types of tree snake that only eat insects. The egg-eating snake of Africa only eats bird's eggs. And the king snake gets its name because it will catch and eat other snakes. In fact, it will actually catch and eat venomous snakes like the rattlesnakes. For a long time, it was thought that the king snake was immune to rattlesnake venom. We now know that isn't true. It's just they have a very, very high tolerance. These little guys are European tree frogs. You can find them right the way across Europe, but it's now been realised that in some areas they can be identified as a different species. So this exact type of tree frog is mainly found in France into Spain. They have sticky pads at the tips of their toes to help them to climb. Uh, but the Spanish population is now classed as a different species. One of the reasons why we've got them here is that there used to be a couple of breeding colonies of European tree frogs in the New Forest. They have now died out. Fortunately, there have been introductions of other reptiles and amphibians to Britain. These include the marsh frogs out in Romney Marsh, and the midwife toad in parts of Lincolnshire, Devon, and Yorkshire. Another introduction is the clawed frog, which is found in the middle of Wales. Unfortunately, those sort of releases and introductions can badly affect the local wildlife and even spread diseases. Our last resident of the reptile house is Cleo. Cleo is a four-lined snake and she's a proper European species. Today you find this type of snake living in areas of Italy and Greece and around the Balkan area. Believe it or not, she's the same general grouping as the king snakes and the corn snakes, known as a genus called Elaphe. Obviously, because it's warmer in places like the south of France and the Mediterranean, you get a lot more reptiles and amphibians. We hope you've enjoyed this quick tour around the reptile house. It's worth mentioning that we do have reptiles in other parts of the park, particularly over near the cafe in our reptiliarium area. Also, Wildwood is a great home for native species. We've seen common lizards, slow worms, and definitely toads in parts of Wildwood. So the next time you visit, do make sure that you come in and see our residents here and do keep your eyes out for native species here at Wildwood.